Good morning. I'd like to tell you a story about success today, starting with one of the most fascinating and successful life forms on the planet. Phytoplankton. Now, I know you're probably looking at your badge, wondering, are you in the right room? You are. I'm serious, phytoplankton. Omnipresent across every ocean, distributed across the world, wildly diversified, with more than 5,000 subspecies, all fully individual unicellular organisms. Phytoplankton is the basis of every maritime food chain and a motor for evolution for higher species. While small, it's responsible for more than 80% of oxygen production on Earth. How did phytoplankton, so easy to overlook, become so successful? Part of the answer is adaptation, of course. Like Darwin's finches, who, when they got to the Galapagos Islands, uh, turned into more than 14 subspecies. But this isn't just a story of competition, of survival of the fittest. There's a remarkable kind of cooperation going on here as well. A fact that's not particularly well known about evolution is it's not only happening as one generation makes room for the next, from parent to offspring. Beyond this vertical gene transfer, you also have a so-called horizontal gene transfer as well, in particular between unicellular organisms like these. They exchange part of their DNA, not to produce new little baby plankton, but within the same generation and even between species. It's like they're doing their own genetic engineering. Some scientists argue that horizontal gene transfer is not only the main reason for phytoplankton's immense diversity, but also it's responsible for some of the key milestones of evolution writ large. Milestones like photosynthesis, the production of energy from sunlight, for example. What you see here is called a dinoflagellate, one of the earliest photosynthetic organisms. Dinoflagellates still exist today, and they make up a large part of phytoplankton, more than 1,000 of the 5,000 subspecies. From the dinoflagellate, photosynthesis spread to other organisms via horizontal gene transfer, eventually forming the foundation for all plant life that exists on Earth today. Now, I admit, dinoflagellates are not exactly the coolest or shiniest life forms on Earth, right? Success isn't always glamorous. Dinoflagellates might evoke another one's dominant creature on Earth, the dinosaurs. But dinosaurs are the polar opposite. Huge, they're the incarnation of power, top of the food chain, an object of fascination for centuries now. They have strong defense systems too, as you can see on this lovely specimen. They're developed over millions of years of survival and selection of the fittest. And yet, they're extinct. They were unable to adapt after disruption occurred in their world. Literal disruption in the form of a meteorite more than 10 kilometers in diameter. So, why were dinoflagellates more successful than dinosaurs? It's quite simple. They're more adaptable, more cooperative, more de diversified, and more decentralized. When there's a lot of different niches occupied by species, there's more stability and more long-term success. And overall in evolution, cooperation sometimes beats competition. Distribution, decentralization, and diversity. These matter in all ecosystems. And that includes online ecosystems. The original conception of the internet featured decentralization of independent servers and websites. And while this was about technical stability, I'd argue it's true of economic stability as well. You can see a cautionary tale in the communist economies of 20th century countries. You had individual factories consolidating up into large conglomerates that eventually proved to be fatally unstable. Contrast that with OECD economies, where 95% of firms are small and medium-sized businesses. The most stable economies are, in fact, very distributed, 
and very diversified. In the online economy, though, we've lost a lot of decentralization. It relies heavily on a single business model, advertising, and it's led by a limited number of large companies. Even the inventor of the web, Tim Berners-Lee, is concerned. He recently published an open letter on the future of the internet, deploring the fact that monopolistic and monolithic structures have created a set of gatekeepers slowing down innovation. He argues we have to fight for a better, more open, and more decentralized web. This is what we aim to do at Stripe. Internally, we say that our mission is to increase the GDP of the internet. And we do this by being a plankton farm, by providing the infrastructure that companies need to grow, no matter their size or stage. We want to enable more companies to get started and to enable more diverse, complex business models. We share the infrastructure we've built with other companies through our APIs, what you might call a form of technological horizontal gene transfer. That way, we're building the substrate for new business models, new online ecosystems, and a real alternative to what we see today. Stripe Atlas is another example of this vision. With Atlas, we've helped entrepreneurs in over 125 company, countries to start an international online business. We do that by simplifying what they need to get started, registering a corporate entity, getting a bank account, and the ability to accept payments and move money all around the world. This is Paolo Tenorio, the founder of Tracto. Headquartered in the city of Maceo, in the northeast of Brazil, Tracto is a SaaS platform that helps small businesses create their own marketing materials in minutes. And they also run a marketplace for freelance designers, giving them an outlet to sell their work directly to businesses. Through this, Tracto is empowering thousands of freelancers and solopreneurs. And they're doing it all from a mid-sized city in Brazil that's normally better known for its sugar industry than for being a tech hub. Or take Zumrad, located in the Gaza Strip. Zumrad is an e-commerce platform that focuses on the Arab world. And co-founder Saeed Hassan is also the founder of Gaza Sky Geeks, a startup accelerator. Here in Gaza, there isn't even a reliable 3G network. The electricity comes on and off throughout the day. But the economic microactivity spurred by Gaza Sky Geeks and Zamrad is not only giving a place like Gaza an economic bridge to the rest of the world. It's also triggering new entrepreneurship, corporate initiatives, and more economic activity elsewhere. This is horizontal gene transfer at work. And there are ecosystems within ecosystems. Within the Stripe economy, some companies act as platforms fostering the growth of others. This is particularly true for the marketplace sector, where platforms bring together buyers and sellers or service providers and their customers. Stripe users like Shopify, Lyft, Deliveroo, and Booking.com play an important role in online economic evolution, as they allow for new economic activity that didn't previously exist. Shopify alone has enabled more than 500,000 new businesses. Platforms reduce the barriers to businesses entering the online economy by providing tools and significant customer demand from day one. Now, here in Europe, the size of internet giants has our attention. If you were to ask people who Amazon's biggest competitor is, many people would say Alibaba. I'd argue that's missing the point. The alternative to giants is not other giants. It's the massive long tail of small to medium-sized marketplaces and platforms that stand to change the way the online economy works. Or you can just look at the data. Today, only 3.4% of the economy is online. It's clear we're going to see an order of magnitude growth in this over the next decade or two. Asking ourselves how the next Google or Facebook or Amazon gets started in Europe is the wrong question. We should focus on the ecosystem, the plankton, not the dinosaurs, on enabling hundreds of thousands of new companies with innovative new business models. I was born in Ireland, 
on the very edge of Europe, where the continent hits the Atlantic. But also, at the same time, I was born in the very heart of Europe. There are few countries that have benefited more from European integration than Ireland. Ireland's economic growth over the last few decades was driven by European integration and the development of the digital economy. Ireland was even referred to as the Celtic tiger, evoking the tiger economies of East Asia. Ireland is a globalization success story. And while globalization has been criticized of late, and there are real challenges that we need to address, I deeply believe in the long-term benefits of the process. It's largely due to globalization that the percentage of the world's population living in extreme poverty has decreased from more than 70% in 1950 to only 10% today. And the same time period, we've seen a steady march towards democracy, going from less than 40% of people living in free societies back then to more than two thirds today. This is no coincidence. And yet, here in Europe, a persistent question remains. How do we best engage with a fully globalized economy? How do we remain competitive as every market becomes global and capital itself, in the form of intellectual capital, becomes increasingly mobile? Regulation can be an enabler. The most obvious example is the end of mobile roaming charges in Europe. I think all consumers and businesses breathed a sigh of relief, and this finally became a reality last year. The European digital single market is another example. Opening up borders between EU member states, helping to make goods and services truly pan-European. Yet, we're still at the beginning. Only 15% of European e-commerce happens cross-border today. Despite all our talk about the digital single market, it hasn't actually happened yet. Now, the regulation at the top of everyone's mind right now is GDPR, which, if you've been checking your email inbox over the last week or two, you'll know comes into effect today. The policy goal of GDPR is to give European consumers more visibility and control into the usage of their data and to add real teeth to existing data policy. While protecting consumers is a necessary and worthy cause, we have to be sure that in doing so, we're not simultaneously making small businesses and startups less competitive. Ecosystems can be dramatically sensitive to the smallest shifts. We talked about the resilience and decentralization of plankton, but very minute changes in ocean acidity can wipe out entire ecosystems. Much as large companies like to complain, they love regulatory burden. It makes their moat wider and deeper. In the wake of the financial crisis of 2008 in the United States, tighter banking controls actually led to the large banks consolidating power, the opposite of the intended goal. So here's my concern. Pending regulations all over the world, not just in Europe, but in Canada and Brazil and elsewhere, can unwittingly advantage the incumbents. And you see some companies even wondering if serving the EU market is even worth the burden. I went to instapaper.com today. This is what I got. It's a very popular read it later service. It's owned by Pinterest, and they've halted service, at least temporarily, for European consumers. Or try visiting the Los Angeles Times. This can't become a trend. We don't want companies to slow down, hesitate, or maybe even give up altogether. Regulation should act to protect users and enhance competition and diversity in the market. It shouldn't lead to any kind of balkanization of the web or pollute the very delicate ecosystem that will bear the next wave of European companies. So we have two paths ahead. One path is towards more centralization, more oligopoly, stalling innovation, a proprietary internet managed by a few players. The other is a more diverse, dynamic, 
and decentralized online economy with a large number of players and more continually being created. Let's make that second path happen. Tim Berners-Lee was recently quoted as saying, when I invented the web, I didn't have to ask Vint Cerf, the father of the internet, for permission. It was a permissionless space for creativity, innovation, and free expression. The future of a healthy online economy rests on our ability to protect it, to foster diversity and that permission to innovate regardless of who you are. A vibrant online ecosystem isn't just better for Europe, but for the internet's impact on society, human welfare, and democracy everywhere. To achieve this, we have to take seriously our stewardship of our internet ecosystem. That's the future we're working on at Stripe, and that's the future I hope you join me in working on. Thank you.